Greetings, everyone. Oh, it's such a joy to share with you this state of mind, this experience of vastness, of empowerment, of transcendence. And yeah, I'm reminded of years ago being in Sweden and sharing a talk that became undoing linear time. It was a talk on undoing the belief in linear time and I kept talking about get off the the timeline. I uh, was staying at a house where I asked them if they had any uh, spaghetti noodles and they brought me a spaghetti noodle and uh, the whole talk I, I did that. I grabbed the, the little long thin spaghetti noodle that there was and the whole talk came through that you have a choice to either see the world from a linear perspective, which is the, the long noodle, or turning it on its side and, and getting to the point, meaning the point of release, the point of forgiveness, the present moment, the point of freedom, the point of unified perception and unified awareness. And so I, I felt to really talk about that and share this joyous experience of uh, transcending the the timeline, or as I said in the talk, get off, get off the noodle, <laughs> release that linear perspective, because that is the perspective of of guilt, and that is the perspective of fear and. The gateway to the Kingdom of Heaven is the present moment, that now is the closest approximation to eternity. This holy instant, this moment. And so, I want to share this because last night Francis and I watched a movie and it was about a simulation. And the whole movie took place on this island and the ocean outside of the island. And gradually as the movie went on, it became awareness that this whole perception of all the stories and the dramas and the motives of all the characters were all part of this simulation. And I woke up this morning and I just had this amazing experience of the dreamer of the dream. It really was an experience that that is what forgiveness is. It is the awareness of dreaming. That is our function, is forgiveness, is awareness of dreaming, is acknowledging fully for once and for all of this glorious perspective this atonement perspective of the dreamer of the dream. And it just dawned on me, I just woke up experiencing this feeling that, oh my gosh, this is the point of everything that seemed to be on the timeline. The purpose of guidance was to come to this point. The point of everything, the perspective, the extremely simple perspective of awareness of dreaming. This was the point of everything. This is the point of everything. In the parable of David, yeah, all the 
coming across A Course in Miracles back in 1986 of opening my heart up, opening my mind up, opening to experiences and miracles, following guidance and travels and traveling all around the United States and Canada and then really all around the world. The point, what was the point of all of it? It was this perspective, the awareness of dreaming. This is it. This is everything. This is absolutely everything. Yeah, I really see now that there is no other point to this world than this perspective of seeing it anew and seeing it clean and free of all judgments. Seeing it clearly, seeing it without any sense of the person or the personhood, without the mask of the ego. This is the point of everything. And I really, oh my gosh, it's just, uh, I just feel that this has been really put on my heart in such a huge way that I'm seeing that this is the perspective in which there are no problems, in which there have never been any problems. This is the perspective that is still. This is the state of mind that is still and silent that looks upon the world and lets all things be exactly as they are. This is the point, this is the perspective of the, the, the famous Beatles song, Let It Be. Speaking words of wisdom, let it be. You see there's nothing to arrange, there's nothing to control, there's nothing to break apart, there's nothing to analyze, there's nothing to fix. There's nothing of the world to change. Mm. This is the perspective referred to in the Rules for Decision from A Course in Miracles text, which talks about uh, you have no control over the world you made. It's a clear understanding, a clear recognition of the script is written and that there's no attempt actually the script has collapsed. The Alpha and the Omega has collapsed into the unified field of awareness. And this is the beautiful perspective pointed to by Eckhart and by Muji and all of the great mystics and saints and sages. This is the power of the present moment. And there is no other. And so, in this experience, I am really filled with overflowing gratitude at seeing that there is no other perspective to hold. This is the purpose of mind training. This is the point to which all mind training leads. This is the state of mind of complete non-judgment, where all things are equally acceptable without judgment. This is the point of acceptance, of complete acceptance, of seeing that nothing ever was out of place. This is the perspective of seeing that everything in this state of mind, everything without exception is in my own best interest because this is the point. This the point of my best interest is is peace, is joy, is happiness, is love and and this was always the point. This is always the point. This ever shall be always the point. Years ago we had a, a teaching program called the Mystical Mind Training Program that we still have and 
initially we built it on a platform called Moodle. And so initially when we were giving the talks and the talks were pouring through in the early days, it was get off the noodle and get into Moodle, meaning get into the mind training that takes you to this glorious, all-inclusive perspective that is the point of rest. This forgiveness point is the point of, I rest in God. This is the perspective that makes way for the vision of Christ. This is the perspective that makes the mind ready for the remembrance of God, the remembrance of truth, true divine love. And this is the point where all problems have disappeared. His workbook, well, lesson number 80 says, let me recognize that my problems have been solved. This is the point in which there are no problems. It's an acceptance that there are no problems. Because the central problem the belief in separation from God or from our source has been corrected. And this is the point, to accept the correction. Not to take responsibility for the error or all the projections of the error, which seem to be the effects of this world. These Effects are unreal effects from an unreal cause, that the world is causeless and the ego was the seeming cause, but the ego isn't real and separation from God isn't real and therefore the effects are not real. So, in honor of this, oh my gosh, this feeling, it's just been radiating and radiating and radiating throughout all of my mind and the vastness of mind. In honor of this, uh, I have prayed and asked to be shown uh, some subsections of the Course, actually from chapter 27, The Healing of the Dream. Because this section has come to mind over and over and over, and, and yet this morning it was just like indelibly impressed across my mind in the most full way possible. It is, is an, it is there, it is, it is resounding, resounding and resounding and echoing throughout uh, the entire Sonship. And, and to me it's the key, it's the gateway. This is what forgiveness is about. I recalled that I read in the Course that awareness of dreaming is the function of God's teachers. So I was aware that, that this perspective is forgiveness, is the innocence, is the healing. It's a recognition. And so, I will go through these two amazing sections at the end of chapter 27. And these last two sections, section 7, the dreamer of the dream, and section 8, the hero of the dream, these put everything into this perspective. This is the hallelujah that is always there, always there for embrace and acceptance. This is the solution. This is the answer. This is literally the key in spiritual awakening. And it's so simple, it's so extremely, extremely simple, but it, it is a juxtaposition to the complexity of the ego and the ego's dream world and the myriad of complex projected problems that the ego throws up 
to keep the solution from being known, to keep the extremely, extremely simple solution from being obvious, from being seen as a simple decision of acceptance. I will accept atonement for myself. So here we go. We're going through these two sections together and oh my, what a glorious awakening. The Dreamer of the Dream. This is chapter 27. The Healing of the Dream is the chapter and this is section 7, The Dreamer of the Dream. Suffering is an emphasis upon all that the world has done to injure you. Here is the world's demented version of salvation clearly shown. Like to a dream of punishment in which the dreamer is unconscious of what brought on the attack against himself. He sees himself attacked unjustly and by something not himself. He is the victim of this quote something else, a thing outside himself for which he has no reason to be held responsible. He must be innocent because he knows not what he does but what is done to him. Yet is his own attack upon himself apparent still, for it is he who bears the suffering. And he cannot escape because its source is seen outside himself. So this first paragraph is pointing to the great projection. To believe in separation from God is to believe in attack and then to project that attack to the screen of the world is the mechanism of blame, of projecting responsibility to something that is external and this sets up a belief in victimization and yet Jesus is telling us, yet is his own attack upon himself apparent still for it is he who bears the suffering. As long as, as the mind is upset, the mind is sleeping, dreaming of a world, forgetting the dreaming and then seeing the cause and the source of the upset the source of the suffering as events happening on the timeline in the past or in the future. Causation is then seen to be in the world of form and the mind is seen to be in this sleeping, dreaming, guilty perspective, a personal human perspective. The mind is, is pushed out of awareness and the, the person seems to be at the mercy of a world outside the person. The person with its belief in a private mind, private thoughts and then an external world that seems to always be offending, triggering, bothering, irritating, annoying. This projected world and the body are all part of a screen that the ego has made up to deflect, to project the upset of separation onto the world and blame the world. Jesus continues the second paragraph, now you are being shown you can escape. All that is needed is you look upon the problem as it is and not the way that you have set it up. He's talking about the ego, not the way that you have set it up, not the way that the ego has set this world up. The ego invented the world, the ego set it up so that it would be a projection of fear and guilt and now you have to decide whether you'd rather be right about the way the ego set all this up or whether you'd be happy. Would you rather be wrong about the ego and about the entire cosmos of linear time or would you rather be happy and peaceful and joyful? That's basically what this perspective is that I'm talking about. This is the choice to be happy. 
the choice to see I am not the victim of the world I see, the choice to be free of the belief that images can cause me to feel anything at all. That peace and happiness and joy and love come from the source, from God, from within me and not from the projected world. Jesus continues here, how could there be another way to solve a problem that is very simple but has been obscured by heavy clouds of complication which were made to keep the problem unresolved? Without the clouds, the problem will emerge in all its primitive simplicity. The choice will not be difficult, because the problem is absurd when clearly seen. No one has difficulty making up his mind to let a simple problem be resolved if it is seen as hurting him, and also very easily removed. This perspective is so amazing, it's so precious, it's, it's everything, and it is easily seen, easily experienced, if the mind is willing to release the belief in the ego and its world, to release the belief in separation and all of the effects of the belief in separation which are all the images of time and space. That's the noodle. That's the noodle that we're saying, get off the noodle, transcend the noodle, rise above the noodle. <laughs> That's what be above the battlefield means. Arise above the noodle of time and space, of linear time. Escape linear time very easily very simply, by not looking to time for causation, not looking to time with the belief that there are things in time that cause upset, or that there are things in time that cause happiness. There's nothing out there. There is no external world. There is no world apart from thoughts and the Ideas leave not their source, so this world has not left the mind of the thinker. And that's the solution. You can't come into this beautiful, high, integrated, whole, unified perspective of the Holy Spirit as long as you believe in an external world. As long as you believe that these images have existence apart from the mind, then Forgiveness will remain out of reach, but once you see that the images, all the images of the world are projections of thoughts, and that these thoughts have not left the mind, then they can be released. A grievance cannot be released when it's been projected to the world, but, but seeing the ego with the Holy Spirit's beautiful loving gaze, seeing the impossibility of the ego, the impossibility of attack, is the forgiveness that brings peace. The third paragraph, the quote, reasoning by which the world is made, on which it rests, by which it is maintained, is simply this. You are the cause of what I do, your presence justifies my wrath, and you exist and think apart from me. While you attack, I must be innocent, and what I suffer from is your attack. So there's the perspective, the blaming perspective, the I am at the mercy of the world belief. And Jesus continues, no one who looks upon this quote reasoning, exactly as it is, could fail to see it does not follow and it makes no sense. Yet it seems sensible because it looks as if the world were hurting you, and so it seems as if there is no need to go beyond the obvious in terms of cause. So it only seems sensible, projection, the world of time and space only seems sensible because it looks as if the world were hurting you. And if you were a body, 
there would be a lot of evidence. That's part of the trick, the belief being a body and then having a world external to that body, or a world internal to that body, where there could be cancer or blood pressure or uh, disease, viruses, a world inside that body or a world outside that body of false causes, of weather, storms, of attack and defense, of guns and bombs and weapons. You know, the whole setup of the belief in the body and a world is all a projection of the ego. It's all a means of convincing the mind that it is vulnerable, it is weak. It's trying to convince you that you're not the Holy Christ, that you are not the Holy Son of God, a perfect creation of a perfect God. It's a big setup. And Jesus is telling us we have to be able to let go of the setup. We have to get beyond this personal perspective, this egoic perspective, which made the five senses, which looks through the body's eyes, which hears through the body's ears, and smells, tastes, touches. We have to let go of this entire ego, body, personal perspective if we are to awaken and come to this amazing, expansive perspective that is beyond the body, beyond the world, that sees the world anew, sees the world as simultaneous and, and it is not linear. The timeline is, is how the mind is kept asleep. The timeline is how the ego tries to perpetuate guilt and fear and pain through blame, through pointing the finger, through seeing things that are, as I said, either believed to be within the body or outside the body. The DNA is blamed. The All of science is pointing at something. Newtonian science is pointing to problems, 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 empirically measured in the world, in the body, in genes and genetics, in, in all of the environments of the projected world, but none of it is true because all of it is a projection of the belief in separation. God is eternal and the eternal creates, creates the eternal. Christ is eternal, an eternal idea in the mind of God. And, and nothing of time and space has anything to do with God whatsoever. God did not create the world, God did not create time, and therefore anything that's invested in, in terms of time and space and linear time, the past and future, that is all invented by the ego. And to believe in it and to project the blame for any kind of upset is to perpetuate the illusion and not to see the illusion. I'm thinking of of this idea that that a dream is a dream is a dream, and when Jesus said in the Gospel of Thomas, be passers-by, when Jesus said in the Bible, judge not, lest ye be judged, he was really offering a way to escape the belief that there is an external world. He was teaching us, the kingdom of heaven is within, it is spirit, it's a spiritual kingdom, it's not an earthly kingdom. It's not a kingdom that involves realms of the cosmos of time and space, but it is a pristine kingdom of light and love that is within. And every time we look out to bodies and persons, every time we think that persons have minds of their own and thoughts of their own, Every time we believe the, the words of the persons, we have to turn within to the Holy Spirit and say, what do you have to tell me? 
And the Holy Spirit and Jesus guide us within to release these erroneous thoughts and beliefs. To release this personal perspective. Ultimately to release the, the human perspective of separation, which sees separate bodies and separate persons, separate countries, separate cultures, separate languages. It sees separate concepts that are in conflict, always in conflict. And, and the transcending perception of the Holy Spirit is far, far, far beyond all of this foolishness, foolishness and nonsense. So this is the key. Jesus continues on in the fourth paragraph. There is indeed a need. The world's escape from condemnation is a need which those within the world are joined in sharing. Yet they do not recognize their common need. So forgiveness, this perspective, this dreamer of the dream perspective is a common need. It is the answer, it is the solution, it is the different way of looking upon the world. And while the mind believes it's asleep and dreaming that there is a, a reality to these images, a reality to this dream, then the need is this higher perspective, this dreamer of the dream perspective, to see the world differently. Jesus continues, For each one thinks that if he does his part, the condemnation of the world will rest on him. And it is this that he perceives to be his part in its deliverance. This is the personal perspective. Vengeance must have a focus. Otherwise is the avenger's knife in his own hand and pointed to himself. And he must see it in another's hand if he would be a victim of attack he did not choose. And thus he suffers from the wounds and knife he does not hold has made upon himself. It's again Jesus saying, as long as you believe in the ego, you will perceive an external world in which there seems to be attacks and injustices. But these attacks are not happening in the world. These are attack thoughts in the mind. The purpose always is in the mind. And either the mind gives into this wrong-minded perspective of the ego and sees an external world, or it comes back into the right mind of the Holy Spirit. It joins and aligns with Jesus, with God, in seeing that there is nothing outside, and these attack thoughts are handed over and given away and dissolved forever by the light of truth and love within. Paragraph 5. This is the purpose of the world he sees, and looked at thus, the world provides the means by which this purpose seems to be fulfilled. The means attest the purpose, but are not themselves the cause, nor will the cause be changed by seeing it apart from its effects. The cause produces the effects which then bear witness to the cause, not themselves. Look then beyond effects. It is not here the cause of suffering and sin must lie. And dwell not on the suffering and sin, for they are but reflections of their cause. So the ego is a belief in the mind, and as long as you believe in it, all decisions that seem to be decisions of people, that seems to be personal decisions, are all just projections, reflections of the belief in separation. They're all the same. The deciding between one illusion and another is not a choice at all. But deciding between the healing perspective of forgiveness and the, and the perspective of the ego, the personal perspective, that is a meaningful choice. And it is just a choice of acceptance coming within to see the nothingness of the ego and all the effects, the seeming effects of the ego, which are the images of the world. So, 
you don't have to struggle with deciding between which food is healthy and which food is not. It's like of these two illusions, the, which is the healthy illusion and which is the unhealthy one? Which is the good, which is the bad in terms of images? Which is the, the helpful and which is the harmful? You know, when you set it off into specifics and you look for the helpful and the harmful in the world of specifics, you are looking where it can never be found. Because these are projections, all of them without exception are projections of the ego. There aren't good illusions and bad illusions in terms of specific images. It's, it's that forgiveness sees the false as false. Forgiveness is the dreamer of the dream that sets the mind free. And that is the choice of accepting the atonement. Not in trying to choose between this image and that image, this outcome and that outcome. This is, purpose is the only choice, and purpose is in mind. Don't have to analyze the motives of others, because these people don't have motives. They don't have minds of their own, they don't have thoughts of their own, they do not have separate motives. It's to come inside and say, what is my purpose? Would I accept the forgiveness of just seeing the false as false and seeing that I am the dreamer of the dream? Or would I maintain this crazy ego game of trying to see people as having motives, situations as having causation, trying to judge it between the good situations and the bad situations, when all the situations are equally unreal. God is not a creator of situational thinking. God did not create the world of situations and persons and places and things. God creates in spirit, and spirit is love. And forgiveness brings us back to our heavenly source, of divine love and light. Deep inside is the peace. The peace is in the light, not in the world of darkness. And so when you unplug, as Morpheus told Neo to do, you know, to unplug from the world, that was what the whole instruction was for Neo, to know that he is the one. And that's how you know you are the one beloved child of, of a of God, of a loving God, is by forgiving, by releasing the belief in an external world, a world apart from your mind. Paragraph 6. The part you play in salvaging the world from condemnation is your own escape. Forget not that the witness to the world of evil cannot speak except for what is seen, has seen a need for evil in the world. And this is where your guilt was first beheld. In separation from your brother was the first attack upon yourself begun. And it is this the world bears witness to. Seek not another cause, nor look among the mighty legions of its witnesses for its undoing. They support its claim on your allegiance. What conceals the truth is not where you should look to find the truth. So he's saying, seek not outside yourself. Do not look for truth among images that were made to hide the truth from your awareness. Do not put any faith in the witnesses of this world what we call nighttime dreams or what we call daily life are all dreams. Dreams are dreams are dreams and dreams have come from the ego to keep the mind from knowing the light of truth within. Jesus even goes so far as to say the dreams you think you like can hold you back as much as those in which the fear is, is present, is apparent. So basically he's saying that if you judge the dreams of the world, which are made by the ego, if you judge them positively or negatively, you are simply reinforcing duality. 
you are simply reinforcing that there are things of the world that are worth pursuing and things that are not worth pursuing. Perhaps it will even tell you to avoid them. But be passers-by. Remember the beautiful workbook lesson from the Course, Lesson 128. The world I see holds nothing that I want. And that the only reason for looking upon the world is that you pass it by without looking for hope in the world of images. Be passers-by. It's again referred to in the, those beautiful teachings in Lesson 128. And why? Why is this the pathway? Why is this like very much like the, the neti neti the, of the East? Not this, not that. It's because the following lesson from 128 is 129. Beyond the world, this world is a world I want. There's a perspective that I want. There's a way of looking at the world that's a brand new way. A clean, clear, crisp way that is without judgment. That's all inclusive. This beautiful quantum field perspective where everything is unified. That is the world that I want. That is the world that sets me free. That is the world that sends me inward to the Kingdom of Heaven, the eternal light that will never go out. Paragraph 7. The witnesses to sin all stand within one little space, and it is here you find the cause of your perspective on the world. Once you were unaware of what the cause of everything the world appeared to thrust upon you, uninvited and unasked, must really be. Of one thing you were sure, of all the many causes you perceived as bringing pain and suffering to you, your guilt was not among them. Nor did you in any way request them for yourself. This is how all illusions came about. The one who makes them does not see himself as making them, and their reality does not depend on him. Whatever cause they have is something quite apart from him, and what he sees is separate from his mind. He cannot doubt his dream's reality because he does not see the part he plays in making them, and making them seem real. So, this is how sneaky the ego is. By believing in the ego, it is the belief in separation from God, from attack uh, upon God. It is the belief in ontological guilt, the sense of, of wrongness or badness, this deep sense of self-loathing and unworthiness. And this belief sets forth witnesses that seem to make the guilt, the pain, the cause of all upset to be external in the world. And yet, people don't upset you. There's nothing of the situations and events of the world that are upsetting. It is simply the way that they are looked upon. And when you look through the ego's lens, the ego is saying, find the source outside of yourself. Whether it's the body, which is outside of you, or the world, which is outside of you. Because remember, a body cannot contain you, and neither can a world. This is a projection that was made to keep you from knowing who you are, as a perfect, innocent child of God. So, when you look to the world for solutions, for answers, for improvement, for satisfaction, for comfort, for convenience, for when you look to the world for anything, it simply means that you are still not seeing that the ego made the world up and the ego used belief in it to do this. And that's why we have to withdraw belief from the ego to dispel it. That's why we have to see the trick for what it is, to see that there is nothing external to our mind. That, that we simply are perceiving the world based on our thoughts and beliefs. And as we 
relinquish or release the ego, we will see the world in a different way. We won't see the linear world anymore. The world becomes unified. The world is unified in this high, glorious perspective. Paragraph 8. No one can awaken from a dream the world is dreaming for him. He becomes a part of someone else's dream. He cannot choose to waken from a dream he did not make. Helpless he stands, a victim to a dream conceived and cherished by a separate mind. Careless indeed of him this mind must be, as thoughtless of his peace and happiness as is the weather or the time of day. It loves him not, but cast him as it will in any role that satisfies its dream. So little is his worth that he is but a dancing shadow leaping up and down according to a senseless plot conceived within the idle dreaming of the world. There it goes. That whole paragraph is basically saying, if, if you believe you're at the mercy of the world, there's no way you can have peace of mind. Because there's so many projected, quote, causes seen as in the world that could disturb you, that can annoy you, that can irritate you. And yet, from the healing perspective, uh, I think of Alanis Morissette's song uh, and her lines, Thank you for your most generous triggers. Whenever there's a trigger, you have a glorious opportunity to see and to release the, the attack thought, the grievance, the judgment that's still held in mind. So whenever you seem to be upset by anything in the world, be it the body or the projected world of time and space, all of the, the planet, the spheres, the people, anything, any situation of the world that seems upsetting is an opportunity to release the attack thought in the mind. It's a purification. It's a purging. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. Now we understand what Jesus was talking about in the Beatitudes. This is the forgiveness. This is the release in the mind that is the only way back to this pristine oneness that is the kingdom of heaven. That is nirvana. That is pure bliss and love and light. The only way to that is to release the attack thoughts, to release the belief in attack. The ego is the belief in attack. It's the belief you can separate from God, so that's the central attack thought, but everything it projects, whether it's wars or destructive hurricanes, or destructive floods, or diseases, or interpersonal dramas and conflicts, screaming, shouting, blaming, all of the projected world, of the complexities of these projections have nothing to do with truth at all. Nothing to do with God. The projected world has nothing to do with God. It can only be forgiven. That is the only purpose is to forgive it, to look beyond it to the light of truth. Paragraph 9. This is the only picture you can see, the one alternative that you can choose, the other possibility of cause, if you be not the dreamer of your dreams. In other words, these are the options. You're either going to have to have the human, personal perspective of linear time and all of the craziness and wildness of false causation and false effects, or you can be the dreamer of the dream and be at peace and be of good cheer, have dominion over the world of images, be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. It's a choice. You can either hold on to the personal perspective of the world, which is the, the individuality, the the sense of individual autonomy, the individual control, individual fantasies and dreams and pursuits, or you can calmly rest in perfect stillness as the dreamer of the dream.
He continues, and this is what you choose if you deny the cause of suffering is in your mind. Be glad indeed it is, for thus are you the one decider of your destiny in time. The choice is yours to make between a sleeping death and dreams of evil, or a happy waking and joy of life. I'm reminded of the amazing teaching from the Course that there is no life outside of heaven. The Kingdom of Heaven, the perfect love and oneness of God, is what life is, and there is no life outside of heaven. There is nothing outside of heaven. Dreams cannot take the place of truth. The whole point is to wake up from the dreams of linear time to eternal truth to a life that never ends, to everlasting happiness and joy and bliss. Of course that's what God's will is, is, is perfect happiness, is perfect joy, is perfect love. Of course that's God's will. And the world of dreams is not the will of God. It is an illusion. It is, it is impossible. Something that exist as an opposite or different from heaven, as different from life, as different from God, cannot exist. But as long as the ego is believed in reality, is, is believed to have any sense of truth, which it can't, as long as it's believed in, then the effects, the projections of the ego seem real, and that's when the mind becomes upset and defensive. It becomes tired, it feels weak, it feels at the mercy of, it feels a victim of things that all have been set up by the ego to distract away from eternal love and light. Paragraph 10 continues, What could you choose between but life or death, waking or sleeping, peace or war, your dreams or your reality? There is a risk of thinking death is peace because the world equates the body with the capital self, which God created. Yet a thing can never be its opposite, and death is opposite to peace because it is the opposite of life. And life is peace. Awaken and forget all thoughts of death, and you will find you have the peace of God. Yet if the choice is really given you, then you must see the causes of the things you choose between exactly as they are and where they are. He's just telling us you have to see the cause of what you experience is either the right mindedness of the Holy Spirit or the wrong mindedness of the ego. Those are purposes in the mind. One is a wish for life, one is a wish for death. If you follow the ego, you are following a death wish, and you are perceiving a projected world of separation. Disunited people, places, things, events. Disunited cultures, countries, languages. Disunited perception. You are perceiving either through the ego the fragmented perception of separation, or you are accepting the unified perspective of the Holy Spirit and Jesus in the mind. You must see the causes of the things you choose between as exactly they, as they are and where they are. They are between two purposes in the mind. You choose between the ego and the Holy Spirit every second and where they are in the mind. The choice is a choice of purpose in the mind, not in the world of images. And where they are in the mind. This is not a choice between things. This is not a choice between outcomes in the world. This thing, that thing, this action, that action. This is not a choice between actions and behaviors and things in the world. Those are effects of the wrong mind. When you choose to calmly look upon the world 
from the dreamer of the dream perspective, you are free of the ego. This is what forgiveness is. Dreaming, awareness of dreaming is forgiveness. Forgetting that you're dreaming and believing you're a human being, a person in the world. This is what wrong-mindedness is. And that's how you forget God. You forget God by forgetting that you are the dreamer of the dream. You cannot go back to God without seeing that you are the dreamer of the world of dreams. It's really so simple. It's so, so clear. It's so exceedingly simple and direct. You cannot be at the mercy of an external world that the ego made up because you are not an ego. You did not create the ego. The ego has no reality, no existence. And it only seems to have effects when you believe in it as a real cause. But God is the cause, and love is the cause. And the ego is not a product of, of love. A death wish does not come from eternal life. You can't get death from life. And eternity is life not the projected world of time and space. There is no life on this planet, as Ken Wapnick one time said, when he was asked about it, sir, what does the Course say about life on other planets? Ken said, the Course says there's no life on this planet. <laughs> we could carry that forth and say, yeah, there's no life in the cosmos. You don't have to go to other planets to search for intelligent life. There is no intelligent life on Earth, because this, this is a projection of the ego belief. Everything. There's no life in, in plants or animals. There's no life in aliens. There's no alien life. <laughs> There's, there is no life in time and space. Do you see what I'm talking about? If God didn't create it, if only life comes from God and life is eternal spirit, then there is no life in time and space. There is no life outside of heaven. How beautiful is the truth. It may seem radical to the ego, but the ego doesn't exist, so it can't really be radical. It has to actually be natural. Love and life, eternal life has to be natural. And division and separation and conflict and disease, fear, they must be unnatural because they weren't created by God. So we go on to chapter, to uh, section, paragraph number 11 here. What choices can be made between two states, but one of which is clearly recognized? Who could be free to choose between effects when only one is seen as up to him? An honest choice could never be, be perceived as one in which the choice is split between a tiny you and an enormous world with different dreams about the truth in you. The gap between reality and dreams lies not between the dreaming of the world and what you dream in secret. They are one. So when he says the gap cannot be between reality and dreams in the sense that you can't see them between the dreaming of the world and what you dream in secret. What you dream in secret is the unconscious mind what you're unaware of, and what you perceive as the dreaming of the world is, is a reflection and is still at one with the dreaming of the unconscious mind. So, you know, you're not going to find the gap between reality and dreams, between the daytime dreams and the unconscious dreams. You're not going to find reality at all until you see that you're the dreamer of the dream. He continues on, The dreaming of the world is but a part of your own dream you gave away and saw as if it were its start and ending, both. Yet, was it started by your secret dream, which you do not perceive, although it caused the part you see and do not doubt is real. So the unconscious mind is this, it's so dark, it's, Jesus says, it's draped with sin, it's so dark, and it's just a belief. Obviously it's just part of an ego belief, but it's so dark that you keep it secret. You, that's why it's unconscious, it's out of awareness, it's pushed out of awareness. 
and then what you perceive as the world of time and space, the whole cosmos, is the dream that you gave away. So you've got the dream that you dream in secret, which is the unconscious mind, the dream that you gave away, and saw as if it had started an ending. It started, the scientists say it started with the Big Bang and that it will sometime come to an end. No, that's the dream you gave away, but the unconscious mind, that dark, repressed, subconscious mind, which is the ego, that is the same as the projected cosmos. The dream that's dreamed in secret and the dream that was given away are both the same. And you see this all when you see that you are the dreamer of the dream. You don't see it split as two things. You become fully aware of the ego, you fully expose the ego, you see it cannot be believed, and then you see you are the dreamer of the dream. And in that perspective you are free of the ego. And yet Jesus continues on by saying, how could you doubt it while you lie asleep and dream in secret that its cause is real? While you're sleeping and you believe you're a dream figure and you do not acknowledge the that it is a dream. While you believe you're a dream figure and you believe you live in a real external world that's apart from you, then you're not going to know this unified dreamer of the dream perspective. And you're not going to know that that the ego caused the world. You're going to believe that that the world just exists and you're also going to believe that the world caused you as a body. That's what we call procreation, mom and dad having sex and creating a baby you that grows up in time and space, you being a body, you being the product of the world. No, you're not going to know you're the dreamer of the dream while you continue to not recognize that this unconscious guilt of the ego caused the whole cosmos. And that you are not at the mercy of the ego, or the cosmos, or the world, because you are in fact the dreamer of the dream. Continues on with paragraph 12. A brother separated from yourself, an ancient enemy, a murderer who stalks you in the night and plots your death, yet plans that it be lingering and slow. Of this you dream. Yet underneath this dream is yet another in which you become the murderer, the secret enemy, the scavenger and the destroyer of your brother and the world alike. Here is the cause of suffering, the space between your little dreams and your reality. The little gap you do not even see, the birthplace of illusions and of fear, the time of terror and of ancient hate, the instant of disaster, all are here. Here is the cause of unreality, and it is here that it will be undone. So he's basically saying, come with me. Jesus is saying, I've got the light, let's go deep down inside your mind, deep within your mind, and I'll take you down past all the darkness, the crevices, the blackness, the bleakness, the draped with sin part. I will go all the way down and I will show you that none of it's real. That the ego is not real, the ego is not who you are, separation from God is not possible. I will take you down and I will show you that this ego and this cosmos of time and space has no reality whatsoever. And in this it will be undone. And here we go. Paragraph 13. Oh my gosh. Oh glory to God. Jesus says, you are the dreamer of the world of dreams. No other cause it has nor ever will. Nothing more fearful than an idle dream has terrified God's Son and made him think that he has lost his innocence, denied his father, and made war upon himself. So fearful is the dream, so seeming real, he could not wake into reality without the sweat of terror and a scream of mortal fear unless a gentler dream preceded his awakening. 
and allowed his calmer mind to welcome, not to fear, the voice that calls with love to waken him. A gentler dream in which his suffering was healed and where his brother was his friend. God willed he waken gently and with joy and gave him means to waken without fear. This is the whole new perspective of the world. This is why it's so important to be the dreamer of the dream that Jesus talked about at the beginning of the paragraph, saying you are the dreamer of the world of dreams. Because from the dreamer perspective, there is no judgment. There is no right people, wrong people. There is no, there's no right issues, wrong issues. There is no right situations, wrong situations. The good, the bad are seen to be as judgments. The morality that seemed to divide the world up into good behaviors and bad behaviors are all washed away as the dreamer of the dream. If, if you are not the creator of the dream, in other words, God created you as Christ and Christ is not a, a victim of a, of a world that cannot even exist. If you see that the cause of the world, the cause of time and space, the whole cause of the cosmos was the ego, and you see the impossibility of the ego, with the Holy Spirit's help, you can see that this is a puff of nothingness. It's like a little mouse roaring at the universe, but it has no reality whatsoever. It's impossible to separate from God. It's impossible to invent death. God isn't the creator of death. The ego is the belief in death. It's a death wish. And once you see that this world is causeless, and you see that the, God didn't create the ego, and the ego has no source, it's just a, it is nothing. Once you see it's nothingness, then you're back to the dreamer of the dream perspective. That you calmly can look upon a happy dream. A unified dream. Now you're ready to see what was denied before. The quantum field, the connect, connectedness, the, the connectivity, the unification, that everything is together. Like the Beatles said, all together now. You know, all together now. This is the perspective of the reflection of love. Of light. You, you see a forgiven world. That's lesson, you know, 129. Beyond this world is a world I want. This is the, the happy dream. This is the forgiven world. This is, this is true perception. This is, is coming to that, that place where you're seeing the world unified and completely without any judgment. And this is why it's the last illusion. This happy dream is the last illusion before all illusions disappear. And you wake up to know your heavenly creator, perfect divine love. You know, that's what, what this whole thing is about. But you have to have a gentler dream first, Jesus says, in which his suffering was healed and where his brother was his friend. And isn't it great? God willed he waken gently and with joy. You know, this Holy Spirit is the spirit of joy. And Jesus is guiding us to a joyful, gleeful, happy awakening. Without fear. You can't be happy and have fear. You can't bring along dreams of fear in which you are the, the dream figure. You have to be the dreamer of the dream in order to awaken from the dream. So here we go. Paragraph 14, accept the dream he gave instead of yours. It is not difficult to change a dream when once the dreamer has been recognized. In other words, you can't change the purpose of the dream until you recognize yourself as the dreamer. You can't relinquish the ego until you see that you dreamed it up and now you can let it go. You Maybe you thought you did it, but now you can undo it. You know, 
Whatever you believed you wished for hell, you wished for death, well now you unwish for hell, you unwish for death, you, you accept forgiveness, you accept a happy dream in place of dreams of fear and malice. He continues, rest in the Holy Spirit and allow his gentle dreams to take the place of those you dreamed in terror and in fear of death. He brings forgiving dreams in which the choice is not who is the murderer and who shall be the victim. In the dreams he brings there is no murder and there is no death. The dream of guilt is fading from your sight, although your eyes are closed. A smile has come to lighten up your sleeping face. The sleep is peaceful now, for these are happy dreams. Wow! Wow, that's what this dreamer of the dream perspective offers. You're not at the mercy of anything of this world. That's what Jesus meant when he said, Be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. He's, he's seen that, that the peace comes from within, it comes from God. It doesn't come from outcomes of a projected world of images. And so he gives us in paragraph 15 he just gives us the most lovely, lovely, I, it's almost like a, while you're sleeping, it's almost like a, a, a beautiful waking lullaby that caresses your mind and, and thanks your mind for following the guidance and for coming within to the dreamer perspective. In paragraph 15, Jesus says, Dream softly of your sinless brother who unites with you in holy innocence. And from this dream, the Lord of heaven will himself awaken his beloved son. Dream of your brother's kindnesses instead of dwelling in your dreams on his mistakes. Select his thoughtfulness to dream about, instead of counting up the hurts he gave. Forgive him his illusions, and give thanks to him for all the helpfulness he gave. And do not brush aside his many gifts, because he is not perfect in your dreams. He represents his Father, whom you see as offering both life and death to you. Brother, he gives but life. Yet what you see as gifts your brother offers represent the gifts you dream your father gives to you. Let all your brother's gifts be seen in light of charity and kindness offered you. And let no pain disturb your dream of deep appreciation for his gifts to you. It's so soft, it's so kind, it's so sweet. That's what the dreamer of the dream offers you. You are not the mercy of the world of dreams. Your nighttime dreams, your daytime dreams, your perception of the dream world becomes very soft. And Jesus, he, he's such an example of that. He was so kind, he was so friendly, he was so open-minded. He he could see the truth of everyone because he recognized the truth within his mind, within himself. If you recognize God, then you perceive everyone with the same kindness and love and gentleness of God. God is not an angry God, God is not a vicious God. That's just an anthropomorphic God of, of projection the ego invented, you know. God is love. God is not angry. God is not fear-based. When the Bible says, be in awe of God, and, you know, the Bible says, fear God and keep His commandments, it's basically saying, just hold God, your Creator, in awe and, and stay in alignment with the law of love. That's all that means. To be in awe obedience with the law of love, to be in alignment with the law of, God, of love. And that's 
what it is to know God, to love God. God is pure love. There is no fear, there is no anger in God. There is nothing but love, but you have to be an obedient of the principle of love. You have to you have to forgive illusions. You have to forgive what God did not create. You have to release what God did not create to know what God is. That's what this is about. That's what this perspective is about. Now, chapter 27 ends with the hero of the dream. And what I've just given is, is the gateway, is the answer, is the solution, it's the forgiveness. And to those who believe in humanity, to those who believe in personality, you know, the, the Greek word persona meant mask. And you can't know yourself as you truly are. You can't really be as you were created by divine love and light as long as you believe in, in the mask. The mask was made to cover over the truth. All persons have personalities and those personalities have vary. They, they, they have seemingly many differences, because they're all projections of the mask of the ego, of the death wish, of the attempt to cover over your true Christ reality. The Greeks said, know thyself, and that self is, is an eternal being that is one with God, and that's why Jesus woke up. He was our way shower because he woke up and saw the eternal nature of love and life. The kingdom of heaven is within. It's a spiritual kingdom. It's not an earthly kingdom. It's, it's not a kingdom of people. It's not a kingdom of bodies. It's a kingdom of love and light. And so, transcendental meditation, uh, transcendentalism, transcending the mask, is what meditation is about. It's what prayer is about. It's what all spiritual pathways are about. It's transcending the ego and coming to know the true being of love and light that is real, that is true. As they say, there's only one of us and that being is a being of pure spirit. And this illusion of separate bodies, separate personalities, separate places, separate times, separate decades and centuries, you know, this whole dream of the cosmos, of time and space, is, is the noodle of separation. Like the spaghetti noodle I talked about, and it's, you've got to get off the noodle, you've got to turn that noodle on its side, and you've got to realize from the perspective of the point, that you are the point, that who you are is the point of everything, awakening to who you are. And the way that you do that is seeing you're the dreamer of this dream. You're not at the mercy of the dream. You're not at the mercy of the world, or time and space. The point, you know, you are the point. That who you are is the, the purpose of the world. Knowing who you are, know thyself is the purpose. There is no other point to this world. That's why to forgive is to fulfill your function and to allow the happiness that you are to come back into awareness. Because you forgive the ego, you release the ego, and when you release the ego, what remains is who you all always have been, will forever be, and that is this beautiful innocent being of love and light. Now this last section is like juxtaposing what we just talked about in the previous section, it's basically saying that as long as you believe you're a body, as long as you believe you're a dream figure, you cannot know that you're the dreamer of the dream. And when you don't know that you're the dreamer of the dream, then you block the light from awareness. 
So I'm just going to read through this last section. It's almost like putting an exclamation mark on on the section I just read. It's like saying, let go of your unconscious fears, let go of your unconscious belief in death, let go of your body identity, let go of your personality identity and awaken to the reality of your of spirit, of, of your life, eternal life in God. So this is called the hero of the dream and it's almost like, it's almost like a parody of what is important in this world because in this world everybody's talking about image and build your niche and, and um, build your identity and uh, you know social media and, and, uh, and pride and, and uh, carve out your uh, own piece of uh, importance in the world. That's what the personality self is and that's what Jesus calls the hero of the dream. And this is the attempt to make a self that God did not create. The personality self, the body self, and the, the world that surrounds the body of course, all that perspective is, is the attempt at making an idol. And the Bible said, you know, hold no idols before the Lord thy God. Hold no graven images. Well, the personality self that the ego likes to puff up, that body image, you know, is is part of the block to the awareness of love's presence. And this course is aimed solely at removing the obstacles to the awareness of love's presence. This is not a course of love, it's a course of removing the obstacles to the awareness of love's presence. Because love cannot be taught or learned. Love is what is. You know, Jesus says in the workbook, we say God is and we cease to speak. That God is, is everything, is, is spirit, it's reality. And this world of time and space is not reality. It's, it's just a world of, of, of time and space and images and, and seemingly change. But eternity is changeless and when the mind fell asleep and believed that this ego was real, then it projected this belief you could change your identity from spirit to matter or from timelessness into time. It projected that belief and then the world seems to be a world of change. But actually it's just a call to change your mind about your mind, to come back to your eternal nature and to relinquish this belief in change. I mean, if God is eternal, why would God create change? There's, there's no need for, for change because Change is impossible. Eternal love is reality and anything that is not eternal love is, is something to be forgiven. So I'm going to read the, the last section of chapter 27, the hero of the dream. And he puts hero in quotes because of course uh, there is no hero. I mean if, if you want to be heroic then just forgive the world and release what God did not create. That's heroic. But uh, the ego tries to paint the body and the personality self as if it's a hero. And throughout mythology and throughout all the hero's journeys that, uh, that Joseph Campbell talked about, the body is portrayed as the hero. All the heroes of the parables of this world are persons and I'm saying the dreamer of the dream is the hero because that's what takes you back to eternity, not the body. So let's look very closely. I'm just going to read this through because it's, it's self-explanatory. If you have any belief that there's something worth striving for in this world as a person, when you hear this last section that will rinse that belief from your mind. Jesus will show you that, that it's actually a joke to think that a personality self can come to take the place of the eternal Christ. The body is the central figure in the dreaming of the world. There is no dream without it nor does it exist without the dream in which it acts as if it were a person to be seen and be believed. 
It takes the central place in every dream which tells the story of how it was made by other bodies, born into the world outside the body, lives a little while, and dies. To be united in the dust with other bodies, dying like itself. In the brief time allotted it to live, it seeks for other bodies as its friends and enemies. Its safety is its main concern. Its comfort is its guiding rule. It tries to look for pleasure and avoid the things that would be hurtful. Above all, it tries to teach itself its pains and joys are different and can be told apart. The dreaming of the world takes many forms because the body seeks in many ways to prove it is autonomous and real. It puts things on itself that it has bought with little metal disc or paper strips the world proclaims as valuable and real. It works to get them doing senseless things and tosses them away for senseless things it does not need and does not even want. It hires other bodies that they may protect it and collect more senseless things that it can call its own. It looks about for special bodies that it can share its dream. Sometimes it dreams it is a conqueror of bodies weaker than itself, but in some phases of the dream it is the slave of bodies that would hurt and torture it. The body's serial adventures from time of birth to dying are the theme of every dream the world has ever had. The quote hero of this dream will never change, nor will its purpose. Though the dream itself takes many forms and seems to show a great variety of places and events wherein its quote hero finds itself, the dream has but one purpose, taught in many ways, this single lesson does it try to teach again and still again and yet once more, that it is cause and not effect, and you are its effect and cannot be its cause. Thus are you not the dreamer but the dream, and so you wander idly in and out of places and events that it, it contrives. That this is all the body does is true, for it is but a figure in a dream. But who reacts to figures in a dream unless he sees them as if they were real? The instant that he sees them as they are, they have no more effects on him, because he understands he gave them their effects by causing them and making them seem real. How willing are you to escape effects of all the dreams the world has ever had? Is it your wish to let no dream appear to be the cause of what it is you do? Then let us merely look upon the dream's beginning, for the part you see is but the second part whose cause lies in the first. No one asleep and dreaming in the world remembers his attack upon himself. No one believes there really was a time when he knew nothing of a body and could never have conceived this world as real. He would have seen at once that these ideas are one illusion, too ridiculous for anything but to be laughed away. How serious they now appear to be, and no one can remember when they would have been met with laughter and with disbelief. We can remember this if we but look directly at their cause, and we will see the grounds for laughter, not cause for fear. Let us return the dream he gave away unto the dreamer, who perceives the dream as separate from himself and done to him. Into eternity, where all is one, there crept a tiny mad idea at which the Son of God remembered not to laugh. In his forgetting did the thought become a serious idea and possible of both accomplishment and real effects. Together we can laugh them both away and understand 
that time cannot intrude upon eternity. It is a joke to think that time can come to circumvent eternity, which means there is no time. A timelessness in which time is made real, a part of God that can attack itself, a separate brother as an enemy, a mind within a body are all forms of circularity whose ending starts at its beginning, ending at its cause. The world you see depicts exactly what you thought you did, except that now you think that what you did is being done to you. The guilt for what you thought is being placed outside yourself and on a guilty world that dreams your dreams and thinks your thoughts instead of you. It brings its vengeance, not your own. It keeps you narrowly confined within a body, which it punishes because of all the sinful things the body does within its dream. You have no power to make the body stop its evil deeds because you did not make it and cannot control its actions or its purpose or its fate. The world but demonstrates an ancient truth. You will believe that others do to you exactly what you think you did to them. But once deluded into blaming them, you will not see the cause of what they do, because you want the guilt to rest on them. How childish is the petulant device to keep your innocence by pushing guilt outside yourself but never letting go. It is not easy to perceive the jest when all around you do your eyes behold its heavy consequences but without their trif trifling cause. Without the cause do its effects seem serious and sad indeed, yet they but follow, and it is their cause that follows nothing and is but a jest. In gentle laughter does the Holy Spirit perceive the cause and looks not to effects. How else could he correct your error, who have overlooked the cause entirely? He bids you bring each terrible effect to him that you may look together on its foolish cause and laugh with him a while. You judge effects, but he has judged their cause, and by his judgment are effects removed. Perhaps you come in tears, but hear him say, My brother, Holy Son of God, behold your idle dream in which this could occur, and you will leave the holy instant with your laughter, and your brothers joined with his. The secret of salvation is but this, that you are doing this unto yourself. No matter what the form of the attack, this is still is true. Whoever takes the role of enemy and of attacker still is this the truth? Whatever seems to be the cause of any pain and suffering you feel, this is still true. For you would not react at all to figures in a dream you knew that you were dreaming. Let them be as hateful and as vicious as they may, they could have no effect on you unless you failed to recognize it is your dream. This single lesson learned will set you free from suffering, whatever form it takes. The Holy Spirit will repeat this one inclusive lesson of deliverance until it has been learned, regardless of the form of suffering that brings you pain. Whatever hurt you bring to Him, He will make answer with this very simple truth. For this one answer takes away the cause of every form of sorrow and of pain. The form affects his answer not at all. He would teach you but the single cause of all of them, no matter what their form, and you will understand that miracles reflect the simple statement, I have done this thing, and it is this I would undo. Bring then all forms of suffering to him who knows that everyone is like the rest. He sees no differences where none exist, and he will teach you how each one is caused. None has a different cause from all the rest, and all of them are easily undone by but a single lesson truly learned. Salvation is a secret you have kept but from yourself. 
The universe proclaims it so, yet to its witnesses you pay no heed at all, for they attest the thing you do not want to know. They seem to keep it secret from you, yet you need but learn you chose but not to listen, not to see. How differently will you perceive this world when this is recognized? When you forgive the world your guilt, you will be free of it. Its innocence does not demand your guilt, nor does your guiltlessness rest on its sins. This is the obvious, a secret kept from no one but yourself, and it is this that has maintained you separate from the world and kept your brothers separate from you. Now need you but to learn that both of you are innocent or guilty. The one thing that is impossible is that you be unlike each other, that they both be true. This is the only secret yet to learn, and it will be no secret that you are healed. So it's impossible to be unlike each other. In terms of the perception of bodies, that's the ego's lens, and of course it projected out separate bodies, separate places, separate things, separate cultures, separate planets, separate galaxies. The ego project, projected a separate world of the cosmos and, and then it focuses in on the body identity, the quote hero of the dream, as the focus of all self-improvement, of, of all benefit, of comforts, of conveniences, that, that have nothing to do with reality. A whole make-believe world of special people, special bodies, special everything. Just a world of cosmos of specialness, time and space, made to take the place of the eternal Son of God. The whole world was made to take the place of the Christ. The whole world was made that you would never know that you are the living Christ. The whole world was made that you would become so distracted with much ado about nothing, as Shakespeare called it, that you would, would not enter the stately calm of peace and love and joy that is within. That's why all spiritual traditions emphasize either prayer or meditation, because they all emphasize going within to the truth of who you truly are and not becoming involved in the ego's judgments and the ego's separation devices. Don't become involved in the mechanisms of the five senses of time and space. Forgive that, forgive it all, and come to the stately calm that is the living Christ. And with that, I mm, I send you the greatest blessings, I send you the happiness and joy of the dreamer of the dream. You are not at the mercy of, of a world that could never exist because it never was created. You are free, you have dominion over the world. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the world. And in your meekness, in your calmness, in your stillness, in your strength of the dreamer of the dream, you have overcome the world. Blessings. Amen. <laughs>